Hello, Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. I'm Father Kevin Long of St. Elias, Antioch and Orthodox Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Today is Tuesday, May 14th, 2024, and here are the readings for today. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. In those days, while the apostles were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the morrow, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about five thousand. On the morrow, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priest's family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power, or by what name, did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a cripple, by what means this man has been healed? Be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you as well. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Let us be attentive. The Lord said to his disciples, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. When I was a kid growing up in suburban Maryland, I used to watch NFL games on Sunday TV, and invariably there'd be somebody in the stands with a rainbow colored afro, white guy, with a sign, a huge sign, that said John 3.16. That's all it said. And of course, we know that what that person was trying to communicate was just how much that Jesus loves people. And of course, he wanted people to understand that in that love, they should convert, maybe repent, and follow after Jesus Christ. You know, my guess would be in the way that he would want them to follow, maybe not just find any old church, but rather find the church, whatever church was sponsoring him, giving them the ability to go to every single one of these football games and have his sign put up while somebody was kicking field goals. Nevertheless, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay. And if you stop there, then you can go all sorts of different ways with it. Understand that if you don't love him in that way, then, well, you're going to go to hell. Or if you don't follow that sign, you're going to go to hell. There's an obsession with judgment. Orthodoxy kind of looks at it a little bit differently. Because, honestly, this obsession with hell and this obsession that everyone is corrupt and horrible, that really comes not from orthodoxy, but from another branch of Christianity that believes that the fall creates sin and since there is sin everywhere, the justice of God demands that all sinners die. And then Jesus has to come not to wipe clean death, but rather to overcome sin. And so there is this idea that 
if you're not with him, then you're just a sinner. Okay, and we're not going to largely disagree with that, but that's not where we start. Adam and Eve didn't bring sin into the world. They brought death. Sure, they sinned to begin with, but there is the cause and there is the effect. We look at cause when you think about everyone being horrible and corrupt and, and morally bankrupt and all of that. We see the cause as the cause and that the effect is for us all that we deserve to die because we sin. It's not that way at all. The effect of Adam and Eve is that from that point on, everyone dies. Everyone dies. And that doesn't mean that people won't be corrupt and horrible and nasty. But that doesn't mean they have to be horrible, mean, and nasty. And that's where this next phrase comes in. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Why? Because in addition to his perfect and blemishless sacrifice offered on the cross, which once and for all destroys the boundary, the gate, the fence, the barrier between us and God, and also renders unnecessary any form of future animal sacrifice, but it's also the gateway through which he goes to the realm of the dead and brings to life everyone who was there. So the sin is certainly part of it, but the sin is cleansed through his sacrifice, but that's not where it ends. Because in the end, the thing that must be conquered is not sin. The thing that must be conquered is death. And so our Lord, in rising from the dead, as he did on that great and holy Pascha, he takes away that ancient curse that Adam and Eve imposed on us all. Not sin, but death. So through him, all have hope for life. So, when he comes, he does not come to judge the world. He comes instead to bring light to it, to bring life to it. And this is the judgment, says the scripture, that the light has come into the world. Now, the problem is that men still like darkness more than they like light, because their deeds are evil. Now, what do we do with that? Well... Quite simply, when we think about overcoming the harshness and the cruelty of death, or better yet, just think about trying to get something fixed on your own. A lot of people tend to think it's up to them to do it. And so they enact all sorts of different things in order to do it. Our obsession with material things, with security, with power, with control, even with sexuality, these things are ways that we try to overcome the finality of death. We want to be able to be in control so that we don't die an ugly death, but rather die the death that we want to choose for ourselves. And that is where sin comes in. When we make those kinds of decisions apart from God, what are we doing? We are doing the things that are sinful. We are completely missing the mark. The mark is that Jesus Christ came to save the world. He came to bring light to the world. He came not to judge the world, but rather to bring it to life. And choosing not to follow after him means to reject the idea of what saves us, to remove ourselves from the possibility of being brought to life, and I mean eternal life, through him. And so that's what we have to understand with passages like this. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? His son came not to teach, although that was certainly very helpful, not to heal, although even that shows the power of his majesty, but to die. We look at the icon of the nativity of Christ and we see him wrapped just like a mummy, just like Lazarus, when we see him coming out of the grave, Lazarus also is wrapped like a mummy. Christ comes to die so that through his death, we might have life. It is not 
his death that once and for all wipes clean the empty and the sin and all of that and the judgment that was demanded by God because all of us are horrible, unrepentant sinners? No, it's the death that is necessary so that he may travel to the realm of the dead and bring those to life like Adam, like Eve, like their son Abel, like the prophets Elias and all others bringing to life those people who had been kept from life because they died. And so this is the message of today's gospel, that out of this tremendous love, he brings us the opportunity to embrace this beautiful thing, this restoration to perfection that existed before Adam and Eve fell, and that we can live into in fullness by living into Christ. This is the message of today's gospel. May we be hearers and doers of this good word. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Have a great day. God willing, we'll see you tomorrow.